teaching is one of those things that if if at least for, if you're lecturing, you kind of want to have an audience. So you got to be able to play off other people. And uh, I was just mm-hmm. like, uh, I was I was I started getting bored halfway through the PowerPoint myself. And <laughs> I was just like, right. and I'm just like. I got to do something. And I was like, okay, when I first started doing this, I I wanted to like start bringing in people I know and just generally interesting people that I I think I was like, I need, I need Dave. And then, so I was like, oh, who else can I? So I ended up scheduling several people in the same day. Have I connected you? Oh, really? Okay. So. Did I connect you with Alice Driver? Yes. And she's on my list now. So it okay, great. Funny, funny thing about Alice is she's in Arkansas right now. Um, so she's up there visiting her I heard her uh her folks. And let me look at this floating panel view. I'm trying to there we go. I'd rather have that view. Um yeah, she's in Arkansas. Hey. She's at she's at OARC right now. And so I was like, Hey, you wanna try to do one of these, you know, while you're still in town? And she's like, well, I would, except, you know, the the internet is terrible in OARC. So it'd be like dial-up speed. So oh. she's like, it could only do, I was like, well, you know, just come to tech and you know, sit down and socially distance across a table or something. And she's like, yeah, I'm kind of busy this week. She's like, can I go back to Mexico? And then you do it there. And I thought, and I thought it was pretty funny that she has to go back to Mexico <laughs> in order for us to do that. Uh, that's amazing. But yeah, so uh, yeah, I think she's. Did she tell you what she's working on? Uh, she's been working on, and an, like, I guess they're continuing her story with the immigrants and working in meat processing plants and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear Oliver? Yeah, it's okay. Hey, <laughs> he's in class right now. I don't know what he's talking about, but he's just like talking to his mom. Kiddo, heard yeah. him. I never can hear him over this. Oh, that's fine. Kiddo, kiddo is more than welcome to join the conversation. He's got a lot to say. Yeah, he does. Agreed. How old is he now? Ten. And do you, do you feel Amazing. do you like do you feel like you're that age now? Like that you have ten year old? Well, I actually I was thinking about this this morning. It's kind of wild because uh, at home I would be considered. A really old dad right but in new york i'm solidly in the middle yeah like to have a 10 year old and i'm 49 years old uh-huh yeah yeah you should have a, you should have a kid in college right now right right i have friends at home who have grandkids yeah, <laughs> can't even <laughs> but then it's kind of wild like oh yeah my son's the same age as your grandkids that's really weird yeah i was telling uh, this one, it's like it's hard to misbehave when i'm in arkansas because i don't have anybody that's my age that's still willing to do that kind of thing you know i go down to texas mm-hmm. and, and it's still it's i guess it's a little bit more like there you know, people don't have kids or they have them older or you know they're still more willing to go out and hang out and go do things <laughs> at night and here yeah. it's like basically you get out of college and you're supposed to get a job and get married and then have you know babies as soon as humanly possible. Oh, and then you go to soccer much. and then you go to soccer games and you, you know mm-hmm. you do these things and that's how you spend your day. So I, I like that stuff, but it's like what I realized was I thought that um, as a parent I would have a lot of influence over my kid. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, we're going to go to jujitsu together. Yeah, we're going to go skateboarding together. It's going to be awesome. And he has no interest in those things. Uh-huh. And it's it's actually been really good for me because uh, what what it's done is it's made me realize that I have to be able to identify his interests. And mm-hmm. then I have to, like, educate myself and pursue the those in some way so like i'm still learning right i think a lot about um when i was a kid and i would like see videos or read about skateboarding stuff Mm -hmm. uh tony hawk's dad was always around he wound up becoming like an organizer of skate contests in california Uh because his son that's what his son did all the time 
Yeah. And on some level, like it became, you know, what he was doing. His son's the one who became famous because of it. I mean, his son became famous because right. he's so a so, skateboarder, but. So what's Oliver into? But he definitely enabled it. So what's Oliver's thing? Uh, dinosaurs and and now video games. Like he's uh, the kind of video games that he's interested in are really, I find it compelling mm-hmm. because he loves these games where they're sort of like they're sort of like Sims games where you have to um, like he has one he's playing now uh, where you have to create an aquarium as a business. Okay. And then you have to like do things where you have to like monitor the tanks. You have to know that certain fish can, you know, only operate within this temperature. And then they eat these kind of things. So you can't put these things together. And, you know, there's just like a ton of amazing rules. And the ultimate guide is, I mean, the ultimate goal is that you're running a business that you want to grow and be profitable. So it's a little bit more than space invaders. Right. <laughs> it's super, it's also like a video game in slow motion. Yeah. Because you get, you don't get like, um, you know, like, like winning isn't blowing up the other ships. Right. Winning is like teaching this business to grow. Right. And there's one, I have, I only have Max around the house, mm-hmm. but the whole way that it started is he started watching this YouTube channel about a Jurassic World game because he's, you know, totally obsessed with dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. So he started watching this video game about this uh, Jurassic World game that's only available on PCs. Uh huh. And so it's been like kind of a struggle because I was like, I don't even know how that works. Right. Like, okay, you can save up some money. And it, he was really diligent about it. He started, uh, uh, like in our neighborhood, we have a like a movie night on the oval yep. and he started selling cookies and lemonade and he got his friend Rocco to go in with him and Rocco like sort of runs lemonade and Oliver runs cookies. And Uh uh, we were, we were testing recipes and his mother uh, steered him, you know, she, she taught him about business. She's like, okay, you have to like, you know, figure out what your expenses are. And then, you have to figure out how much each cookie is going to cost you mm-hmm. and then how much you can sell it for to make a profit. And then at the end of the night, uh, when you figure out how much money you've made, then you have to subtract the profits and then you have to reinvest some of your money into your business for the next week. Right. And so he started doing that and uh, they got rained out a few times, but like, you know, one of the nights they both pocketed $65 after paying all their expenses and reinvesting in their next week. Wow. You know, like, (laughs) yeah, maybe I'm, you know, I wouldn't hate it, but, uh, business is like a weird thing because I'm not any good at it. Right. Uh, but it's also hey, whatever, like I, I, I feel I'm reassured by the idea that, uh, he has, uh, strong enough personality to know what he's interested in Mm -hmm. and not be so concerned with what his dad's interests are. Right. So I think that's a strength. I'll go with that. Okay. I think my parents are the same way. Like my parents were just like, they had no idea what to do with me. David Sedaris said this really amazing thing uh, that I think about all the time, but he was, he said that with his parents, uh, he was like, uh, like they were farmers and he was a giraffe that they were given and <laughs> yeah. they had no idea what to do with the giraffe. So they just hooked it up to a plow. Okay. So they just don't know. That's, That's how I felt with my parents. Yeah. I th- well, hopefully I will know what to do with my giraffe. I have been hardcore about not giving people advice on parenting or giving any sort of insight because well <laughs> not. <laughs> so but i'm gonna go with mm. where you said I, you know i'm gonna break here for a second because i realize probably right now we 
possibly have a handful of like 20 year olds watching this and they're like okay i don't even know who this oh. David Hall is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, i didn't know that we i didn't know we we're actually watching this right now i thought we were just going to record something we are yeah. we are but you know just let it run <laughs> You know, okay. Go right. full yeah. like Joe, Joe Rogan and just like talk about anything and everything. Um. So for yeah, for those. Oh man, do the kids watch Joe Rogan? I have no idea. I watched last Sorry. night the Joe Rogan uh, interview with um, Jamie Fox. Yeah, it was so good. It's just so good because they're just like goofy old friends. Like they both kind of started out in comedy about the uh-huh. same time. I actually, and now they're both like. So I, I make a lot of twelve hour drives to South Texas, and I ended up like I, I can't listen to music that long. So I, I've gotten into podcast, and Rogan is actually mm-hmm. one of those guys I just really sort of enjoy listening to. And I guess I fit the demographic, but yeah, right, totally. and it's, it's that he just sits around and he, he talks to people like they're just friends. And um, mostly, I just like he has some really interesting people on there. Um, yeah, agreed. I, I I like Joe Rogan a lot. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to do a project called The Toughest Man in Comedy. Yep. Because I don't know if you remember, he had like that big beef with Carlos Mencia like 15 years ago. Okay. But he was, you know, he was already like, you know, serious about jujitsu training, uh-huh. serious about boxing and kickboxing and stuff. And I see all of those instances. Like I saw him, uh, him and like a few other people like outside of uh, a club one night. Mm-hmm. And all I could think is like, man, this is so crazy because that fucking goofy fucker could beat up anybody out here on the sidewalk. I don't even think they realize it. Yeah. Hey. But that whole thing with Carlos Mencia, I just was like, no, Joe Rogan's definitely going to beat him up and he's going to get blacklisted from everything. <laughs> and now it's sort of turned the other way. Uh, like nobody knows who Carlos Mencia is anymore. And Joe Rogan's like, he's yeah. rich. Yeah. Now he's a. Uh... He he's moved to Texas as well, so like you know, he's basically my neighbor. Oh, he did. Yeah, he moved to Austin. Oh, nice. Like it was a uh, like he went from L.A. And I think he just, he'd been talking about it. like his. You could see he had a growing love affair with Texas, and then when all the yeah, yeah he started, likes to go hunting. He likes to be out in the yeah, and it was he likes the personality, yeah. all the Navy SEALs, and all the you know that kind of mentality. And then he was just like, uh-huh. I think we're going to move to Texas, and they did it in like a month apparently. Like he decided to move to wow. Texas and then just did it. So, yeah. So, yeah, he's in Austin now. That's awesome. Crazy. So, by the way, I'm going to go back and do the thing I still haven't done is introduce who you are. Like, hey, everyone, this is David. Oh, Hall. yeah. <laughs> talked about that. I'm going to stop talking about my kid. That's all right. I'm going to talk about Rogan and kids. See, it's the same thing. We're just old friends. We're just catching up. Uh, so, David Scott Holloway. So, that's a, another thing. When I was talking to Alice and I... Uh, I was like, hey, you don't know me, but Dave Holloway told me, uh, you know, I should, we should, we should know each other. I just messaged her. And she's like, who's David, Dave Holloway? And I went, and I sent her to the website, <laughs> and she was like, oh, David S. Holloway. She's like, I've never known him without his full name. It's, like, it's just Dave. So uh, for those of you listening, Dave and our roommates, or no, we weren't roommates. We I hung out in his room a lot uh, with him and Hutto. Lovers. <sighs> We were classmates back in college, and uh, we had we just kind of ran in the same circle and ended up becoming friends. And then one of the things that I like my first mem one of my first sort of memories of you is just sort of sitting back. Is like I think that guy's a little bit insane, so I think I like him. <laughs> there was just sort of like <laughs> it was like so. Dave was always the photographer, and so these days he is. You're in living in New York, living in the photography world, and you've been doing it pretty much since college, right? So you graduated college. Mm-hmm. I, re- I remember specifically, because we graduated in the same time, you had a camera cleverly hidden in your gown and like a little trigger. Oh, release. yes. And you were oh, yeah. with a thing sticking out going, click, click, click. Yeah, I have an awesome photo of me walking across the stage. Uh-huh. So I don't know if you remember, but like when they read, you know, you wrote out your name yep. and then it was given to them and then they read the thing. Yep. Uh, so my middle initial is S. My middle name is Scott. Uh-huh. But in the thing, I wrote David Slacker Holloway because <laughs> we had a friend, Crystal Bryant, who always called me Slacker. 
Uh huh. And so I put that in. And so then when I'm walking across the stage, they read David Slacker Holloway. And you could just see their faces like, <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a photo. I'm like, it was like, I've got the remote in my hand, the trigger in my hand, and then like the photo of my hand reaching out and then just like them holding the diploma and just like looking at me like, really? Oh, no. <laughs> this is what we have to deal with. I got, you know, that was a fitting end to your time at tech. Let's be honest. <laughs> no, that actually wasn't the end. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give any names away, but I, uh, several people have brought this up to me recently. Uh-huh. I, uh, I liked to play pranks. Yep. And one of my favorite pranks, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. I hope every one of you tries to prank me in this way. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got an internship in DC right after I graduated. And uh, as an intern, I had access to the postage machine, Uh like send out all the mail. Yep. And you could print barcodes on the, did I send one of these to you? No. I don't know if I did. I don't think I was that mean to you. <laughs> uh, you could print barcodes on the envelopes and make them look super professional. Yep. So I made all of these envelopes that said something like uh, National HIV Testing Institute and, you know, Washington, D.C. and I had a barcode on it with pro. And then I printed an envelope. I mean, I printed a letter where inside it, it said in huge letters, positive, and then fold it up. So if you hold it up to the light, you can see the word positive. Through it. But then when you open it up and look at the letter, it says something like, I'm positive. You're going to think this is hilarious. And then I just wrote a letter catching up with them. Uh, but the thing is, when I left school, I didn't have most people's addresses, mm-hmm. uh, so I sent them to their parents' houses, which was gosh, really great. <laughs> so I have a friend who went to Fayetteville. He was still in school, and I sent it to his parents' house, and he had recently been tested, uh-huh. and his dad got the letter, and his dad like obviously like looked at it at the light, was like, oh, no, and then called him. And was like, look, you got some mail here at the house and whatever. Mm-hmm. My friend was like, oh, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I'll get it in a couple of weeks when I come home. He's like, I don't know. It seems kind of important. I think uh-huh. we should uh-huh. do this. And then he's like, yeah, oh, okay, all right, well, whatever. And he had already gotten his results, but he was like, I don't know, maybe there's something. Yeah, okay, right. open it. Right. His dad opened it. And then every time that I saw his dad after that, he was like, Dave, I didn't forget what you've done. <laughs> so he's like always super like, oh, yeah, you're that kid. You're that. And then another friend, uh, another of our classmates I sent one to, uh, he told me that his mom like framed it and put it up in their house for years. She thought it was so funny. <laughs> and then another friend who was still at Tech, I sent it to him. And uh-huh. he told me recently that he, you know, went to the post office, got the letter, and then was so nervous that he went in the nearest bathroom and sat in a stall and, like, shook and wept for, like, you know, a long time before he could get the nerve to open up the letter. So all these people, I totally expected all of them to, like, at some point plan some dastardly demise. Right. There's there's a thing. You know, to, like... Yeah, you're you're saving up for a, a healthy dose of karma. <laughs> who was it that uh, who was it that was arrested by postal uh, agents recently? Oh, it was um, someone famous. Yeah, um, it was uh, 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 um, Trump's old campaign guy. Uh, Got arrested. What's his face? He. Um, Oh, oh, Bannon. Bannon, yeah. Was it Bannon? Yeah. Yeah, it was Bannon. Yeah, he was arrested on his boat or someone's boat. Yep. Well, uh, one of those same people that I sent up <laughs> one of those letters to, I was also making postcards. Mm-hmm. And this is 1997. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I had downloaded a picture off of the internet. Uh, I don't know if this, I don't even know what's, uh, what's appropriate to talk about in here, but it was a photograph, a very early internet photograph, super low resolution of one man taking a dump on another man's chest. <laughs> and I thought it was so, so funny. I printed it out. I made a postcard and I sent it to a friend of mine. That friend got a call from the post office saying, uh, you know, got a summons, you got a summons to the post office. And then he called them, and they he said they're being super cagey. They wouldn't tell him. They go, look, the you know the person's not going to deliver this. Uh-huh. You have to come pick it up. And then he went down there, and they had it in like a Ziploc bag with a thing on it that said evidence. And they wouldn't give it to him. They wouldn't even let him touch it, like the real thing. Uh-huh. They're showing it to him in the bag and they were grilling him on trying to figure out who sent it because oh i'm sure it broke some sort of indecency right you know rule uh but those were those were like you know postal agents and i'd forgotten all about that until steve bannon was arrested and, and like, i was like whoa those guys might have come and got me if he would have ratted me out could have come and arrested you off your skateboard <laughs> Right. Oh man. Oh. Are there? Is there anyone skating at Tech? Is that a thing? It's yeah. It, but the thing is, you know, when you were there, it was you know, it was hardcore against the rules. Now, it's, yeah. now it's just like a form of transportation. Like I don't see anybody doing like that's that. awesome. I don't see anybody doing like cool skating. They're just like going down the sidewalk, mm-hmm. but they're not you know that's awesome doing anything else. So. um we had a couple of semesters where everybody, they had all those little scooters, the mm-hmm. like, scooters and all that. Um, they're not there anymore, but yeah, I've, I've got an electric kick scooter now. It's kind of my favorite thing in the world. Yeah. And that, so those got real popular for a little bit. And, but I think the, yeah. they got tossed off campus for whatever reason. I don't really know why, but oh, so, um, yeah, they're dangerous. Hey, real quick. Scooting is a crime. Let's talk about photography. Let's talk about photography. Let's, let's, for you, here's one of the things I want to bring up about you, especially for my good old kids at Tech. Um, you grew up in Oklahoma and Waldron and ended up coming to Tech. And now you're kind of at the top of your game, or at least top of somebody's game. Uh, let me refer, okay, let me refer you. Somebody's game. That's going, all right. You're having a good time. We'll put it that way. You've, you've got to do interesting things. So, um, and at one point, I want you to tell the story about losing your your press pass to the White House, um, and then, oh, yeah. and then I want to talk about the debate from last night because you're one of the few human beings on the planet oh, because I actually got to sit. You've actually got to be in the room for those things in the past. So, mm-hmm. first of all, can for my students now, can I give them like a rundown of like your past and kind of how you got from. Point A to Manhattan. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I graduated high school, Walton, Arkansas, and uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. I always assumed that I was going to become a professional skateboarder. And um, I was, I was photographing some then. Um, I, you know, had, a, had some pictures in trash magazine and, but nothing good. Like when I look back at those files now, I'm just like, you know, they were negatives. When I look back at like the pictures I have of the pages from Thrasher and stuff, I'm like, oh, those are all terrible. Like the skating's really good, but the, oh, those are garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I had a couple of instances that happened that were really transformative. One is I was skating curbs uh, near this grocery store in Waldron and I hear all the sirens and I see smoke and um, there's a house on fire. So like I skate over there and I'm standing there watching, you know, the firemen show up and Mm -hmm. everyone's going. And the editor, Michael, the editor of the the local paper, the Waldron News, was a volunteer fireman. And so he's working Mm -hmm. and then he sees me there and he's like, David, my camera's in the front seat of my truck go get it and, you know, take some pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And so I go get his camera out of the thing and I'm, you know, trying to figure it out. And 
the house. It's like a big fire and the firemen are like, you know, working. And it was awesome because I had total access. You know, the firemen are like, yeah, shoot this. Right. You know, in here, whatever. And it was, it was really like, it was really awesome because the next day in the paper, whatever day the paper came out, big picture on the front of the paper that I took of a fire. And I hadn't even mentioned it to my mom. Uh-huh. I was like out skating, whatever. And she gets a paper and she's looking at the paper and she's like, Oh, this is weird. This photo is credited to you. Like, oh yeah, I shot that picture at the fire the other day. Like, uh-huh. What are you talking about? I ran into Michael like you know sometime that week, and he was like, "Oh my god, that's great!" You know, how you know you want to shoot anything else for the paper? Let me know. I'm like, oh yeah, it would be great. Mm-hmm. I just started hanging out at the newspaper, and then he taught me how to develop film. Mm-hmm. So it was a dark room there, and so I, then it was kind of great because I was shooting a lot. I didn't pay for anything. This was all black you know? and white stuff at that time too, right? Or was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's all black and white. Okay. I mean, I guess the, I don't know what the deal was. Uh, yeah, I don't actually, I mean, everything, the stuff that I started shooting almost exclusively was black and white. Okay. Um, but the paper had the front page was colored. So actually, I don't know what I started shooting. When I'd go in there, the dark room was black and white. I'd press it. And uh, I was processing black and white film. And uh, it was kind of awesome because it, I became, I just sort of became the photographer for the newspaper. Mm-hmm. I had been working as a, at, a radio, at the radio station. There's a bluegrass radio station in town. And I had won a contest to be the DJ for the last shift. They, they had a thing with all of the, they wanted someone like young and cool. They wanted to engage something else. Mm-hmm. And it was a bluegrass radio station and Waldron has a bluegrass festival and it's fun. And I like bluegrass, but at the time it was not what I was into at all. Right. But my dad was just like, Oh, just go try Go, right. You know, go do a thing. So we went and we sat in there and we read things on the microphone and then we talked about some stuff and it was awesome because <laughs> You know, I got a four hour a night job at uh, at the radio station, Mm -hmm. which was, you know, also really useful once I got to school and once I did a lot of other stuff. You know, I really just would go to work. um, It's kind of crazy, actually, to think about because I think that I went to work at eight and then I worked on midnight. Yeah. And I would just go with my comic books at the store next door. I'd sit in there and like read comic books and then like song would be over and I'd start doing it. And it was awesome because I talked to the, the station manager into letting me do like a country crossover thing. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, I played a lot of Steve Earle and a lot of like sort of pop country stuff that wasn't really the demographic for the thing. Right. But you know, a lot of kids started tuning in and it was like kind of a useful thing. Anyways, working for the paper was really good because it got me super engaged in my town. Mm -hmm. Like there was like no reason to not go to every single thing. Right. You know, people are always excited to see me. You know, I was like a a seven year old old kid. It's like, all right, I'm going to go to, uh, you know, whatever, whatever I wanted to, like I took assignments, but I also did a ton of enterprise stuff where I would just Mm -hmm. go, I'm going to go to the fair and like play around with like long exposures or I'm going to go, you know, ride the the ride with those girls so I can like take a picture of them in the ride or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was super liberating, you know, uh, just to be involved in my community and like uh, my aunt owned a restaurant in town and so i knew a lot of people anyways but i didn't i i really got to know them when i worked at the newspaper because people are like you know like kind of awesome stuff like uh some guys saw me on the street one day and stopped me I'm like oh david david you gotta take a picture of this they had in they had the biggest uh snapping turtle i've ever seen 
um, in the back of their truck. Oh. And they had, you know, they're like, oh my God, yeah, we caught this over here. Unless they still they caught it. Still the place, it, no, it, it was still live. Okay. Yeah. It was crazy. It was like, I was terrified of it. You know, they had like a tire iron there, like, watch. And they'd hold it in there and they'd go, and, it's basic. and then they just pull it across. I, uh, yeah. I had a pet snapping turtle for a while in college, but it was only about that big. Um, yeah, but oh, this I'm thing just, was massive. I'm just sort of imagining. Yeah, I mean, basically, you're looking at a dinosaur in the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, yeah, and it was super cool. And you know, they're like, I'm shooting, you know, pictures of them, you know, like posing around, whatever. Mm -hmm. But people recognized me in the neighborhood, in the town, and like would engage me for things like that. And so it was kind of awesome. And uh, the newspaper, they would give me things to do. But they were also just super, like, wow, these pictures are great. Whatever you want to do, go do it. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because I don't know what year. Let me see what year Photoshop came out. Because that's definitely when I started using Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop's like 30 years old now, I think. Photoshop. Typing. I don't know. What it doesn't matter. But it's so I started using Photoshop. Yep. Then they had Mac computers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I still those kind of like off white uh -huh. giant things. Right. Like they're so crazy. Uh, but even that, like, I would sit in the newspaper all night long just playing on Photoshop. Just affecting text or you know mm -hmm. whatever it was amazing you know we used it primarily for layout stuff i think we're laying out with cork and photoshop and then you know i'd have to make these half tones of the things which you know we didn't really use photos in photoshop we were just making graphics with it right um, pretty well so i don't know uh so anyways then uh, I went to school in Fort Smith for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Did terrible. Uh, I would drive up there, and then I would skip class, and then I would run around Fort Smith because it, it was like going to the big city for me. Right. And uh, hang out at the mall and like just not do any work at all. So then uh, I eventually lost my financial aid. I got booted from what it was west arc at the time now i think it's u of a ufus smith or something yeah. like that yeah yep ufus yes so then i took like a year off and i was like just skating and photographing i was working in uh you know part-time in a grocery store in my town mm -hmm. and i did like a ton of jobs i worked in my aunt's restaurant i was just doing a little bit of everything and I had this uh, had this vision. <laughs> I had just gotten. I had just. Oh, actually, no. This was the second time. So wait. Then I left and went to tech. Mm -hmm. I was at tech for one year. Yep. And then I did the same thing that I did in Fort Smith, and I got my financial aid taken away. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back to work again started working at the grocery store and then one morning i was in there waxing the floors five in the morning and had a vision that i was going to be manager of this grocery store if i didn't leave and if i became manager of this grocery store i would never go anywhere yeah that would so be so then my boss comes in and i told him uh yeah, I, I'm going to give you my notice. I'm going back to school in like, I know it was two weeks or four weeks, whenever the semester was about to start, mm -hmm. I was leaving. Mm -hmm. And so I then, I had to take two classes and get at least a C to bring my grade point up enough that I would have my financial aid reinstated. Mm -hmm. And so I'd saved up enough money that I took two classes that seemed easy enough for me to take and get a C. And I lived in my car in the Payne Hall parking lot, and um, I worked 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. at the Denny's uh, cooking. 
And then I worked from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Trans Restaurant as a busboy. Mm -hmm. um, Trans isn't open anymore, but right. Uh, so both of them, I took both jobs because I knew that I would have food to eat. Uh huh. And you know, I'd make a little bit of money, but then I slept in my car. And then I'd go to class, and I'd get up and go to the Chinese restaurant, come back, go to my other class, and then I'd go back, sleep a little bit, and then I'd go work all night long at Denny's, and then come back and sleep for a few hours before I had to go to class again. And it was terrible. And then, uh, I mean, it's a whole different story, but I was showering in Payne Hall, because I had lived in Payne Hall. Right. And back to skateboarding. Uh, I'm sure Robert McKinney is probably a cop in uh, in Russellville. Still, he's a cop somewhere. I don't know. I don't. He was a guy that I right by now. He was a he was a cop when I was there. Yeah, maybe. So, okay. Well, he and I had like a, a like a long standing beef uh -huh. because skateboarding used to be illegal on campus, and I would right. skateboard on campus. And he would constantly try and chase me down. And I had all of these games that I would play. I'd always just run away from him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I started, I lived in Payne Hall and I would keep all my stuff in the bathroom uh, in the shower. And then uh, several times I would like, they would chase me and I'd run back to Payne Hall and I'd throw my skateboard in the bush and I'd run inside. And then I would like, just go jump up in the shower and then I'd hear them beating on my door and I'd come out of the shower like with a towel on carrying my stuff and they'd be like, David, I know it was you. I know it was you that was skateboarding. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been here showering. Impressive. And it's good hygiene. Uh, so this dude hated me. <laughs> and he there's also like a time because I didn't understand how school worked and I, I was kind of dumb about it. But he finally caught me one time. He and this other guy caught me, and I, I was, like, sitting on the curb, and he's, like, writing me a ticket, and my skateboard's laying there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, okay, you can have your skateboard back once you pay this citation. And I was like, I stood up, and I looked at it. I was like, how much is it? And he's like, it's $75. And I was like, fuck that. And I jumped up, and I kicked my skateboard and broke it in half. And I was like, you can keep it. And I flipped him off, and I ran away. <laughs> And I didn't realize that because he was a campus cop, I wouldn't be able to enroll in my next semester without paying the fine. That fine, yeah. And so then I not only had to buy another skateboard, I had to pay the fine. Uh, but that dude hated me. And so he one day, when I was showering in Payne Hall, actually showering, not uh -huh. hiding from him showering, I'm sleeping in my car. I'm walking out to my car and I got a my towel folded up and my dirty clothes folded up. My hair's kind of wet. And then he's standing there by the door and he's like, Mr. Holloway, uh, what are you doing? He's like, uh, taking a shower. And uh, he was like, uh, are you a resident of Payne Hall? And I was like, man, you know, I've always lived in Payne Hall. And he goes, are you currently a resident of Payne Hall? And I was like, no. And so then he arrested me for theft of services for showering in the dorm. Wow. Robert McKinney, you still suck, dude. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so that was like a, a, a catalyst. After that, I became an RA. I got a room for free. I didn't really get it for free. I worked a lot. All right, let's talk. Okay, so let me just go ahead and energize. energize. Oh, yeah, back on target. At, at, no, the com <laughs> I, just, we'll hit a common mentor of ours. You, you probably met John Gale about this time. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, it's a hero. He like, saved me all the time, even that time. <laughs> I uh, Yeah, my first day to walk on, on campus, uh, I went down to the TV studio. Because you're always a photographer. I was always on the video side of things. And again, and George was down there and I was trying to find John and he was like, no, John's not here. He just had his first child today. And then he, oh. and it was like, her name is Tally. I went and, and then George came and was like, Tally light. And it's like, okay, Tally. Okay. Tally. So there's, and, but yeah, and then I got to meet uh, Holly who also ended up, his wife um, kind of became a, 
another hero of mine because I used to walk around with like just taped up Converse. Um, not because I couldn't afford shoes. It's just, I, it's, that was the, the era. Like a duct tape. Yeah. Converse Cause you know, the soles were coming off and Holly grunge, br- man. Holly <laughs> brought me a pair of John shoes one day. <laughs> it's a school. <laughs> She's like, wow. she's like, Billy, I just see you wearing these shoes and I just want to make sure that I'm like, I have shoes, Holly. Thanks. I just choose not to wear them. <laughs> but when I was in school in Waldron, uh-huh. I always had like ripped up jeans. Yep. And there was an English teacher there who, uh, he would always comment on the way that I was dressed. Mm-hmm. And I had like a jacket with like studs and stuff on it, all the stuff that I had made. Mm-hmm. And one day in class, my jeans were like all shredded and tore up. And he goes, everybody, let's take up a love offering from Mr. Holloway so we can buy him a new pair of pants. And he went, so he's like walking around the class with like a, a thing trying to get money from a bunch of kids. So I'll wear a new pair of pants. Uh-huh. I wound up getting best dressed in my like school like <laughs> thing, and I totally like I went to him. And I was like, I don't, know, I don't know if you're my enemy or if you're my friend, but I'm always gonna dress this way. And then I never dress like that anymore. <laughs> Holly's amazing. You know, Tally lives here in New York now. Yeah, I do. Yeah, seriously. And uh, she was literally the very first baby that I ever held. Really. Because I was standing in Witherspoon one day, and Holly comes through with the baby. And she's like, I've got to go to the bathroom so bad. Hold Here, this. hold the baby. And she handed me Tally, and I had no idea how to hold a baby. So I'm like just holding her out like that. Uh-huh. And I was I was amazed at how like dense she was. It's like <laughs> so much heavier than I thought it was going to be. It's like a little thing. And then like, they're like, no, hold it up there next to you. I'm like, no, it's <laughs> holding around here like this arms quivering. These, these things leak. I'm not getting close to me. Right. <laughs> yeah. No idea. John, you know, John was actually super influential to me uh, because he literally knows a little something about everything. Uh huh. And like more so than probably most anyone that I've met. Mm -hmm. And especially at that time, he like constantly, like I would like think that I was a wizard, like, you know, like really into something, you know, that I wasn't, Uh that I wasn't, uh, you know, I thought that I like had like just discovered something and then he'd be like, Oh, well, do you know? And then he'd just give me like some deep knowledge on it that I was like, Holy crap. Wow, I don't know anything. I don't yeah. Oh, so then I would just go to the library and dig deep. We didn't have the internet really. We barely had the internet. He uh we had bullet board systems. He hired me to help him put a documentary together when I was I don't know, junior or senior. And we were, and I literally just traveled around the state with him for about two months, just going places. I probably learned more in those two months of just kind of shadowing him than I ever did in the rest of the school. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I also found out exactly how dry his humor was. Um, <laughs> the man can crack a joke and, and it's five minutes later when you figure it out. <laughs> so. Yeah. He's so smart. Dude, he, he did some wizard education stuff for me too. Uh-huh. So I don't know if, if the, if the communications broadcasting students have to take, intro to mass communication still Mm -hmm. yep i used to teach it uh but i don't what time is it now what time do you teach that class i don't teach it anymore but um i tried teaching it once at eight o'clock in the morning and then vowed never again so it was always after that it was always like 11 o'clock oh see you were what i needed it was always at 8 Uh a.m and so i did a bunch of i would like i was like out with Jeff Oliver and a, you know a couple other people, we'd always be skateboarding all night long, mm-hmm. or I'd be in the dark room all night long. I'd always be doing something all night long. And that class, which was required, mm-hmm. was at eight a.m. Mm-hmm. So I would always go to the class, but I would go sit in the back of the class and I would promptly fall asleep. So I had to take that class three times. <laughs> the third time that I went in there, I was like, "Oh my god, I just got to get through this class. I just got to do it." 
Mm -hmm. John came to me and he was like, David, I need your help with something. Like, okay, you know, what is it? Like, There's a girl in class uh, who needs a, a desk set up for her every morning, and I would like you to be in charge of that. I was like, yeah, okay, sure, fine, whatever. The girl comes. There was a girl who didn't have any arms. Mm -hmm. And she had like a little desk that she put in front of her thing. And she'd mm -hmm. come in, take her bag up, get her stuff out and do it. So like the first or second day of class, she always sat right in front. Mm -hmm. So then I'd have to sit right next to her in front. And, uh, you know, she's like, I'd get her set up. She's doing her thing. And then I would sit there across my arms and I'd start to nod off. And she kicked me in the leg. I was like, what? What? What is wrong? She's like, David, you're embarrassing me. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> okay. All right. Fine. So then I sat, I stayed awake, and I realized the class is very manageable huh. as long as you pay attention to the stuff. Oh, yeah, this is all common sense stuff. So then... I watched all the lectures. I read all the things because she kept me awake mm -hmm. because I wasn't going to embarrass her. Right. And I totally believe that this was all part of like John's master plan to like steer me towards finishing the school. I be it's like some weird, it's so far beyond me that he liked, he was like, okay, I've got a plan here. All the pieces are in place. David is finally going to pass his class. He's like your personal and it worked. Mr. Miyagi. He's just like, he's just sort of the zit or right. master of, you know, mass comm. Yeah. Yeah, man. All Maybe right. Sure. You finally make it through college. Okay. Yeah. Finally make it through college. Uh, in college, one thing that was really important for me is I started um, pitching stories to newspapers, big newspapers all over the country. Okay. And um, I did a little – the most successful thing that I did is uh, I went to Alaska uh, with Fred Gladys and Sabin Bhattacharya and uh, someone else. But Fred and Sabin and I all tr you know, mostly traveled together. Mm -hmm. And then I, we went and we worked in the fishing industry, and then we came back to school and we would – I had to make money and it was super useful, but I wrote, um, I wrote a series of articles about going to Alaska to work in fishing. Mm -hmm. And then I started writing a series of articles about traveling with no money. Uh -huh. And those got picked up a ton. So then in Dr. Tyson's class and a little bit in Tommy's class, uh, there would be, assignments that I didn't get done. We were mm -hmm. supposed to turn in the assignments and go, well, I don't have that, but I've got this. And then I'd have like a, a clip of a story in like the Dallas Morning News or the LA Times or something in the travel section. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of uh, uh, I got a lot of credit for those stories just because I was, you know, putting myself out there. Uh, yeah. Not doing a very good, I'm still not, I'm still, I'm an, I'm a, I'm a good journalist, but I am not a good student. Mm -hmm. uh, I think is maybe a safe way to say it. Or I wasn't. I'd say I'm probably a really good student right now. I'm teaching myself uh, the intricacies of Adobe Premiere. Oh, okay. it's very rewarding. Ah, well, I can help on that if you ever need some. That's what I do. I I do <laughs> need some help. I I love it so much. Uh -huh. But I was using Final Cut for a long time, and like I don't do a lot of editing. I don't do any editing that's very serious on a lot of the projects that I've done that have been substantial. Mm -hmm. We've always hired an editor, right. you know, or there's been an editor for it. So I never had to really learn the sort of nuances of it. And uh, now I've been obsessed with YouTube for a while. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've done a couple of other things. And a lot of my friends who do this stuff are like, no, you got to you got to dump Final Cut. You should be using Premiere. Mm -hmm. like, it's just better. This is just did you immediately more robust, more complete thing. You discover like, oh, this is basically Photoshop, except it moves. It's just like I can do all these things and, and yeah. things like, oh, I know where that tool is. 
Well, I don't know where any of the tools are. That's the reason that I still edit in slow motion. Uh-huh. I need to get one of those keyboard things with all like the shortcuts on it. So oh, yeah. I can, you know. But it, 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 it is definitely like, I mean, I think like being super comfortable in Photoshop uh-huh. makes Premiere seem possible. Yeah. But also there are so many videos, not just videos of people explaining things, but like when you're watching like videos that, some like random kid is doing somewhere mm-hmm. uh, uh, posting it on YouTube and he does something really tricky mm-hmm. or really beautiful or whatever. Then I'm instantly like, Oh wow. If that kid can do it, I definitely can do it. Right. And so then I just, you know, rabbit hole into like studying premiere, uh, which is, it, I really like, I'm actually super, it's super frustrating, but I, I really love it. And I've done a couple of things where I was trying to teach myself how to put multiple uh, videos in one page and one frame, yep. making like a frame in After Effects and whatever. Yep. And um, I wasn't getting some things to line up. I was having, I was a little bit frustrated with the controls. And then I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and sat down and it instantly made sense. I was like, oh, yeah, wait, no, I just got the numbers wrong. Boop, 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 boop. Everything lined up, and then I was... Uh... So you should be sleeping at some point when you're trying to learn something. Yeah, because you're, you're in your dreams, you're actually processing Premiere. You just don't know it. Oh. Yeah, totally. I, uh, I picked up Premiere in... Ni- I, I, it was 1998. Oh, that's fantastic. Holy crap. 98. Uh, 98. I bought one of the first editions of Premiere. Because, well, the thing was, I learned everything. I guess it's kind of the same difference, like, you know, going from darkroom to digital. Like, everything, you know, was VHS tapes when we were going through college. And it was, tapes, uh-huh. you know, VCRs. And then everything swapped over to computers. And I was like, holy crap, I don't know how to do, I don't know how to do the thing that I'm supposed to know how to do. And so I had a... Uh, I remember specifically I paid $500 for a 20 gig hard drive uh, in 98. And, and I thought I had like, I, I, I called it my supercomputer and I bought one of the earliest versions of Premiere and it literally sat there for six months. And I just kind of stared at it going, I don't know what to do with this. And I eventually just started hacking away on it. And then kind of the same thing happened with Photoshop. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just started hacking away. And then I started I got a bright idea because Jeff Oliver was living in Napa then, and there was a uh, there was a Photoshop conference in San Francisco, and I'm like, hey, I can go see Jeff, stay with him, and then I can go to this conference. And then I actually started going to Adobe conferences, and I was like, holy shit, you can do that? And it was just like, these are all the things that I didn't know that I could do. And then it was like, oh, and that's all you have to do? And then, yeah, and it started to open up doors. Uh so, oh yeah, kids, you should all register for Adobe Max right now because yeah, it's free. It's free, and it's next month, and it's crazy that it's free. I went to that in Las Vegas a few years back, and that is oh really? Yeah, uh, I got to, yeah, I managed to get the university to pay for oh. me to go there, and yeah, I was like, where has this been all my life? <laughs> so right, yeah. right. So yeah, I'm encouraging everybody. Just go, just do it on. Do it. Online. It's free. So, all right. Amazing. This is the bonus of COVID. Okay. Right. Uh, so I graduate. Yep. I leave and go to an internship in Washington D.C. Yep. And uh, I'm interning, and I'm also sending out. Uh, it was at a place course. called Youth Today, sending out mail, and I'm. Uh, you know, just freelancing, trying to get little jobs around town. It was actually really amazing at the time because Bill Clinton was president. And I had a notebook, uh, actually like kind of a weird thing. You know, Marianne Selman, (laughs) she was uh, on the board at tech. She was Clinton's first campaign. uh, I know chief of campaign or whatever her title was. I don't know what it was. (laughs) She ran his first campaign. She was on the board at Tech. I think she she might have retired. She uh, she's a state senator in Arkansas, and so there's a bunch of people that I had sort of met 
through her or through some other people, but I had a little notebook full of names and phone numbers and like some random note. Oh, uh, this person told me to call them Mm -hmm. or, you know, that person, um, whatever. It was just like, honestly, like a little bitty notebook full of names and phone numbers. Everyone has some sort of connection to Arkansas. Right. And so people just told me, yeah, when you get there, call them and tell them whatever. Um, and what was it? I mean, there were so many of them. Anyways, I got there and I would just like randomly call people. Hey, uh, I'm David. I'm Mark and so I graduated from tech last year. And, you know, I'm here doing this. So and so gave me your number. And almost every single time Mm -hmm. it would lead to something like usually not like a glorious job, but like, right. You know, someone like, Oh yeah. You know, I know we're going to have this party. You can come photograph this party or you can do whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was super useful just relying on, you know, the sort of guidance that other people had given me. And then, uh, I had, Oh man, so much weird stuff happened then. I actually don't remember how I wound up in the Don Ray media office. Uh, but um, they had an office in National Press Building, and uh, Don Ray, Don Reynolds owned the paper in Fort Smith and the paper in Las Vegas, and right. a bunch of his business was uh, like small to medium papers. Yep. And he had a bunch of them. And um, then when uh, I wound up in the office one day and I met one of the guys, it's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm from Arkansas. And, like, that was it. Like, they started giving me assignments. And it was cool. I started shooting on the Hill more. I started shooting in the White House a little bit. And uh, because I was shooting for all, all the papers, shooting for the paper in Vegas, and I was shooting for paper for smith Mm -hmm. um and they had a news service sort of but a lot of times there would be an arkansas connection from you know like whatever the assignment was Mm -hmm. so then it would just you know piggyback on to the next thing that person oh that's great you know you should meet this person right and so i uh i kept doing that i wound up having an accident um at one point where I uh, was <laughs> uh, so messed up, uh, I, I got super messed up. I like uh, separated uh, two vertebrae in my spine. I fractured four ribs. I ruptured my spleen. I broke my wrist. I broke my ankle. Uh, I had a ton of stuff that was wrong. And I couldn't do anything for three months. Mm-hmm. And I had to. I had to wear shirts backwards because uh, I had pins in my oh. in my back. Yep. So I had to wear button up shirt like backwards, and I had to sleep on my stomach. I had to do all this terrible stuff. Uh, but I wound up. Uh, I lived in a house with a bunch of other people, including Jason Hutto, and I wound up getting food stamps because I couldn't. I was disabled uh, mm. at this point, and. Um, it was kind of an awesome thing for our house because then we'd go to the grocery store and my roommates would just, we'd buy grocery carts full of food, which we never did before. We were all broke and like, you know, doing whatever. Well, anyway, Weren't you living when I could move it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. What? No, I was just thinking, weren't you living with a band uh, this time. at that point too? No, that was after. Okay. That was after. Okay. A little bit later. Okay. Uh, but this, I lived with Jason Hutto, who, who also went to tech, because I had moved to D.C. to do this internship, and I had moved into a house full of women. Uh, several of the other ones, there were like six people lived in the house, mm-hmm. and several of the other ones were also interns at different places. And when their internships were up, they left. So it was me and a girl named Yolanda and a girl who also still had an internship at the White House which was going to last for like six more months or something like that. 
when I wrote a letter, we had to fill up the other rooms. And so I wrote uh, letters to and called a bunch of people that I knew. And I said, look, this is your one opportunity to move to D.C. for an affordable price. Mm-hmm. You can move into our house. We're going to have four rooms and it's going to be a thing. And I lived as far away from D.C. as I could. Not intentionally. That's just where Yolanda had this house. Uh And so I had to skateboard like 25 minutes to the bus stop and then take the bus from George Mason University to the train stop, which is another 20 minutes, and then take the train from the very last stop all the way in town. Um. Oh, man, there's some – actually, that's remind me so much of uh, – a lot of times I would come home, it'd be – I'd go to a show or something, and it'd be too late because the trains in D.C. closed. So I would just go sleep in Lafayette Park because the backtrack, spring break of my senior year, I was in D.C., and I was hanging out in Lafayette Park, which is now called Black Lives Matter Square. Mm-hmm. Uh, there used to be 42 people who lived in the park. Um, and it was like a pretty well orchestrated thing that I had photographed a guy there, uh, who was a homeless white separatist. Mm -hmm. And I photographed him with this flag that he made with these Nazi SS bolts. He's got a big beard. He's a crazy guy. His name, he he went in Zeus and, uh, he, uh, I, went and I got the pictures printed at a one hour lab. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to give him one of the pictures. I couldn't find him. And I met another guy who I'd met with him and gave him thing. He said, Oh, I'll give it to Zeus. You know, no problem. Then the day that I was leaving town, uh, I walked back through the park again and he was there and he's like, David, Oh, the picture, it's the best picture I've ever seen. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's so good. Thank you so much. I was like, oh, wow, that's great. You know, uh, I want to come back and I want to do a photo project on you. Mm -hmm. Like being a crazy, like white racist living in a park in Chocolate City. It seems like the worst idea in the world. He's like, that would be great. Okay. I was like, I don't know how to find you because you don't have a phone or an address. And he's like, every day I'm in the park at some time every day. So if you come here. You'll be able to find me. Okay. So then I took the bus from DC to, uh, from Arkansas to DC, mm-hmm. and I had about $35. And I was going to stay in a park with a homeless guy and like, live like homeless people do, documenting him for this time. And I looked around for him all day long. I couldn't find him. No luck. Then, like that evening, I'm sitting in the park on a bench and I don't know what to do. And I start talking to this woman. Uh, Carol, Mm -hmm. and I tell her, yeah, look, I'm looking for this guy, and I can't find him. I came. I was going to do a photo project on him, but he's not here. And so now I don't know what to do because I'm not supposed to leave for two weeks, and Mm -hmm. I don't have any money or anything. And she's like, well, you can stay with us. You know, you can stay with my friends. We'll show you how to do it. You can photograph us. And so it was her, her boyfriend, Richard, who went by the name Mountain Man, Mm -hmm. and uh, her ex-boyfriend Marshall and they were kind of a little crew and they were part of the 42 people who lived in Lafayette Park and so then I started staying in Lafayette Park and I met all the people and like did all the things and I became number 43 so I did, I did so much amazing stuff it was actually super wild because I had done really well at college photography there's so much backstory here God, I need to write a timeline or something uh, to write I had done really well at college photographer of the year. Uh-huh. And so I got invited by uh, university of Missouri to come for the judging of the professional photographer of the year competition. Uh-huh. And like, you know, I'd go load slide trays and watch the judge and whatever. And two of the judges, one was Joe Albert, who was the DOE at the Washington post at the time. And uh, the other was this woman named Young Hee Kim, who had won Photographer of the Year, who I had actually met previously, briefly, uh, in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. But I met them there, and they both lived in D.C., 
and they both gave me their info. And I was talking to Joe, and he said, well, if you're going to come do this project, you should process your film every day so you can see if, you know, you what you need to be working on, what you're missing, and, and whatever. Right. So he let me come to the Washington Post and use the darkroom. Uh, and it was... Uh, it was pretty amazing because Lucian Perkins, who worked at the Washington Post, had just won World Press. And so he had a big exhibit in Amsterdam, and he was printing all the photos in there. And I would be in there, like, you know, like doing my stuff, and he would talk to me, like, what do you, what do you think of it? Is the contrast okay? Like, man, why is this guy asking me? Uh huh. This guy's like a big deal. He's won a Pulitzer Prize. He's like, you know, done all this stuff. And, uh, you know, I would like tell him what I thought and you did it. And then at the end of like the time that I was there, at the end of the time, he, when he was finishing up the thing, he gave me one of the work prints that he had made from the exhibit. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that he knew that I was sleeping in the park. Uh-huh. So, you know, I kept doing stuff. Then I was done. I got this amazing print, which is in the bedroom right now. But I just rolled it up, stuck it in my backpack. And then walked back down to the park. Uh-huh. She got a big tear in it. It felt crinkled and everything. And it's like, you know, probably one of the, you know, more valuable prints that I own. And I, you know, at the time I was just a kid sleeping on parks. So I didn't think much about it. But anyways, I photograph all this stuff. It's pretty good. And there's a lot of like amazing things that happen. Like one day it's raining and everyone's out. And so I just walked to Georgetown where Yonke Kim lived. And knocked on her door and was like, oh, what's going on? And I was like, oh, sleeping in the park and uh, I, it's raining. There's not a lot going on. I just thought I'd walk over and say hi. And she's like, she made me hot chocolate, but gave me some apples. And like, you know, we talked to now she lives here. I live here. Like the relationships, like the people that you meet, you will continue to meet, meet them like sort of through everything. And everyone winds up being kind of beneficial she she is a very vocal person mm-hmm. she, you know she won photography for a year before she's very uh smart she's a very committed journalist uh she is very opinionated and some people uh like she's done a lot of really amazing things she started her own grant program she like you know was given five thousand dollars to people who are submitting grants uh to her is she wants to support people doing like good work. Right. And it's pretty amazing. But, uh, I wound up at like a party or something and I met some people and they're like, Oh, I know who you are. And like, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, young, he Kim, she was talking about you. She says, you're crazy. <laughs> and I was like, what? And you know, young, he Kim, is crazy so if she thinks you're crazy i don't know if i'm ready for this so it's like part of a ridiculous like uh you know just a ridiculous reputation that i i felt obliged to live up to for a little while Mm -hmm. anyways back to the story i did all that stuff i go back to school i'm committed to doing uh you know journalism like good journalism. Uh, I was then dating a woman from Tanzania uh, and I wanted, she was going to go to Tanzania for the summer. I wanted to go. So I started researching uh, internship possibilities in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. I got the first internship at uh, the citizen, Wananchi, which is, uh, and the express It's two papers, but it's the first independent paper in the country. The country was a socialist country for 20 years, and um, yeah, so much actually happened there. Uh, The country was a socialist country for 20 years, and so this was the first independent newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to go work for them. It's like the roots of journalism in America. I'm Ben Franklin here. This is awesome. And I go, and then... It was very educational, but sort of the way they operated, sort of the way they told stories, mm-hmm. felt to me to be a lot more like my high school newspaper. Oh, yeah. And uh, I 
you know, I was doing some stuff. I took a trip to Zanzibar. When I came back, the editor's talking to me, and he's like, oh, what happened? I go, oh, Zanzibar was really amazing. But everyone was trying to sell me drugs. Like, guys were constantly trying to sell me drugs. Ah, you should write a story about, uh, you know, the drug problem in Zanzibar. Uh-huh. Go, no, there's not a story. It's like I'm a white guy getting off the boat in Zanzibar, and people think that I got money. Uh-huh. And that I probably do drugs and travel around, whatever. And he's like, no, this is a good story. You've got to do this story. I'm like, uh, okay. So I call the police station in, in Zanzibar, I'm trying to talk to this guy. I was like, hey, can I get any statistics on, you know, drug arrests in Zanzibar? And he was like, what are you talking about? I go, well, what kind of records do you guys keep on you know, who gets arrested for possession, who gets arrested for selling, what what kind mm-hmm. of drug charges are there? And he's like, everything is in the book. I was like, what do you mean? And so there's like a literal log book. Like if someone gets arrested, they come in and then they like write stuff in the book. But they're not keeping statistics. Nobody's analyzed their stuff. There's no information Mm-hmm. It's just an editorial me going like, oh, wow, it's like a white guy traveling around Africa. Everyone thinks that I want to buy drugs. But the guy was really adamant about me, like, like oh, you should do this story. This is good. This is thing. I don't know. So I wound up taking a trip to Nairobi. Mm-hmm. And then I met a guy named Reed Hoffman at the Associated Press. He was the bureau chief at the Associated Press. And then I met the bureau chief at Newsweek. And... Uh, talked both of them into uh, into letting me freelance in Tanzania for Associated Press and for Newsweek mm-hmm. because it was, they were having their first multi-party elections. So then I would do – I would still go to the internship because that's where I learned most of the things about what's happening in Tanzania. But then I would write stories that I would pitch to AP mm-hmm. uh, and send them pictures, which we would – print in our lab at the uh, darkroom in Tanzania. And the amazing thing about that is I brought, uh, this is another tech story. So when I was getting ready to go to Tanzania, I started reaching out everywhere for support. Like anyone that I could think of, any company, I would reach, hey, I'm going to be an intern in the fourth poorest country in the world. I need some support. And uh, someone I don't know who. Could have been John Gale. Could have been Tommy Mummer. I don't know. Someone gave me the name of a guy named Jack Kelleher and gave me a phone number, and he worked at Agfa. And so one night I called him. I was like, hey, um, my name is Dave Hall. I'm a student at Arkansas Tech, and I'm going to internship. I'm just trying to see if any kind of corporate support, uh, you know, film or otherwise, to go on the trip. And then he's like, oh, great. You know, and he starts asking me all these questions. He goes, well, where do you live? And I go, oh, well, I live on campus. He's like, yeah, yeah, but w- which dorm? And I go, oh, I, I live in Payne Hall. He was like, oh, that's great. I lived in Turner. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he, he actually was like in x-ray sales or something like that. Uh-huh. Lived in California. But he's like, yeah, just make me a list. Fax me a list of what you want, and, you know, I'll take care of it. And so, you know, I made, like, a modest list. I wanted, like, a couple of hundred-foot spools of black-and-white film of this film. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, you know, a couple of boxes of paper and a little bit of chemistry. And he sent me, the first time, he sent me two or three huge boxes of stuff, like... 5,000 sheets of paper and like, you know, 10 hundred foot rolls of film and all this stuff. And and then I took most of that with me to Tanzania. But when I got back, he sent me a box of stuff probably every month, month and a half for the rest of the time that I was in school. Wow. It's just a random guy who went to tech Mm -hmm. who, you know, I reached out to. And he wound up being like my benefactor for several years. So one of the things that happened because of that is I recently 
looked on LinkedIn for every person from tech uh, who like lives in the New York area. I was like, yeah, I should just connect with them. I should just do that. And there aren't a lot, but I've reached out to several of them and like, like some of them are super interesting. And, you know, at some point I'm sure that our paths will intersect and it'll be a useful thing for someone. Like if any of them needs help from me, I'm totally game. Uh, one of the super other important things that happened to me during this time, I was still a student at tech. Mm -hmm. I was living in, in Tanzania, uh, and I went to Julius Nyerere, the then president, socialist president of Tanzania, the guy who decided that Tanzania needed to be a democracy, and he was stepping down to hold the first multi-party elections. He had a house and a big table in this house, and uh, all the journalists, when he'd have a press conference, he'd sit at one end of the table, and then the room would fill up with journalists and we would all sort of be there. And the first time I went there, I'm standing at the far end of the table, like tucked in with a bunch of guys that I know, other journalists in town, maybe like 60 people in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, he sees me, and I'm the only white guy in the room. And he's like, Zungu, like, white guy. Oh, not kid, like, get over here. I was like, oh, man. So I'm like, walking through, like, squeezing through everyone, and I, like, mm. you know, get up there to him. And he's like, who are you? And I was like, oh, I'm David. Uh, I, you know, covering the, the elections for the Associated Press, and I'm living in Tanzania now. And he's like, ah, you know, I guess it's good to tell our story of democracy to the world. You know, here, have a seat. And I was like, no way, dude. Almost everyone in this room has hooked me up at some point. There's no way I'm going to be a white guy that steps to like the front of the line. I'm going to go back there with my friends. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you later. And I go, and he had like a couple of these things that I went to. Uh -huh. but then one day, leaving his house, and I see a white guy standing like in the yard, you know, next door, like working on the gate or raking something. I don't know what the thing is, but like, I like run over to him and I start talking to him. I was like, Whoa, who are you? What's your story? Whatever. And his name's Hugo and he's a fisherman. He's married to a Tanzanian woman. I'm like, Whoa, I want to go fishing. Like, you know, what's it? It's crazy that a fisherman can live next door to the president. This is amazing. And we become friends. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I see him around and it's like, uh, my buddy, and then one day I'm over at his house, and there's a woman there that I recognize. I, I was like, oh, I think I know her. Oh, this is weird. And he comes in, and he's like, uh, ah, David, uh, mother, this is my friend David. David, this is my mother, Jane. It was Jane Goodall. And Of course it was. Uh, <laughs> then I understood why... <laughs> the fisherman lived next door to right. the president. But so like that was like kind of a weird like thing. Then fast forward several years later, I'm living in DC and one of my friends uh, is doing PR at the Jane Goodall Institute. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know. I don't know how I didn't. I'm not that bright sometimes. Hopefully I'm better now. But I didn't realize, because I'd read her book. In her book, she calls him Grub. She always refers to him as Grub. And her husband's name is Hugo. Okay. So I never put it all together. But anyways, Hugo is Grub. So then fast forward, I'm having dinner at some friend's house, and then we're talking about uh, Jane, and um, she's telling me how expensive it is to license photos. Because this guy, Nick Nichols, a uh, geographic photographer, owns like the biggest body of work on her. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then her husband's like, I don't know, why don't you just have David make some new photos of her and uh, save yourself a ton of money? And she's like, will you do that? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, whatever. Sure. sure. So then the next time that Jane was in town at a thing, she scheduled for me to come in and shoot some portraits of her mm -hmm. for the Jane Goodall Institute to use. And so... I'm like in there, I have like a little janky setup in this room and I'm kind of hanging out waiting and 
I think that, I don't know, I guess I'd never told her that I had met Jane before. Mm -hmm. And so Jane's like coming in, there's like an entourage of people there all kind of walking in and Jane like sees me and stops. And like my friend told me that she was worried that she was having a stroke because she just like froze and she's like staring at me and I'm like, what's up? And then there's a, you know, big pause. And she's like, aren't you Hugo's friend? And I was like, yeah. And so then it was just like, awesome. I started then you you know, traveling with, with her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you never know how some stuff is going to work out. Uh, and it was really useful. You know, I, I had other jobs and everything, but like, you know, I traveled to a lot of places with Jane uh, over six years to just document whatever she was doing. And she was really, uh, you know, I, I think that I learned a lot about kind of the way that I operate, which is very standoffish and kind of reserved. Mm -hmm. Because she, like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a chatty Kathy, but I also, like, when I'm working, I don't like to be in people's face. I like to sort of let things happen and I'll direct things a little bit if I feel like I need something more, but like I'm pretty good at reading people and going, okay, we've got to be done here. We've got to do this quick or whatever. And she told me one day uh, when they needed a, a new picture of her for something, um, you know, she came in, I was like, uh, I go, okay, you ready to do this? This is going to be awesome. And she says, David, I would rather go to the dentist than do this. And I was like, you're hurting my feelings. <laughs> but we shot some pictures and like the, one of the pictures that I shot that day is a real simple picture of her with her like hands up. It's like the picture that she uses as her bio photo and like most of her books still to this day. And so like, that's kind of awesome. Um, a little bit is I like got the right window. She doesn't want anyone else to photograph her because she fucking that experience i was one of the things Anyways. you did and it's so it feels like all conversations with you at some point end up on anthony bourdain but that was one of the things i think you told me was the reason you he liked working with you as your journalism background is you didn't come in and try to overproduce photo shoots you're just like walk in i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna be a bit of a fly on the wall and just kind of get in get out and not bother you and you're like here you go we're done yeah yeah, it was good. And he, he once he realized, like, so I have a story that I've told a lot. It's the very first time that I directed anything with him. Mm -hmm. We were uh, we were in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and we're just hanging out. We're just not we're waiting on some things to come together. We're not really doing anything. And it was like a cool wall, like space and background. So I just go over and go, hey, you know, you got five seconds we jump over here and shoot a couple pictures and then, you know, we're not doing anything. And he started like uh, rolling his eyes and him and hot and everything. And I was like, okay, whatever, you know, it's up. He said, no, no. Okay. It's fine. You know? And then he like went over and he like stood there and he was cool. Shot a couple of pictures. I shot, I think five or 10 frames pretty quickly. And I was like, okay, that's great. Thanks. And I turned around and walked off and he was like, what? And then later that trip when we were leaving, when we we're flying out, he and I were on the same flight, and it was this kind of amazing Wes Anderson thing at the airport in St. Petersburg. The terminals are like you know kind of a wave, and you go through these underground tunnels to get to them with a super long people mover, mm -hmm. like a moving sidewalk thing. And I'm standing on the sidewalk. And it's literally, it's got to be the longest one I've ever seen. I don't know how it keeps going, uh -huh. but it was like kind of comical. And I'm on it and it's like moving so slow and it's really early in the morning. So I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get anywhere. I'm not late. I'm I'm hundred percent the first person there, but then I'm like halfway down and I turn around and I look back and I see Tony step onto the thing. And I was like, oh man, this is like super funny. Like he's this tiny person in the distance mm -hmm. and, you know, we're just moving at the same speed through this goofy people mover in Russia. Then I get to the other end, I sat down and I'm the only person in the room and, you know, I'm like, 
I don't know, read a book and playing a game or something, whatever. And then he comes in and he like sits down and I said, you know, I look up and I go like, oh, hey, I just want to say, yeah, man, thanks for letting me come. And then he was like, no, thank you for being the most, I know I've got it written down. He was just like, uh, he's like, yeah, you don't, you don't waste any time. You know, I appreciate that. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll never waste your time. I go, you know, if I tell you I want five seconds, I want five seconds. But sometime I'm going to ask you for 10 minutes and it's totally going to be worth it. And so he never said no to me, you know, mm-hmm. which was really great. You know, there are a couple of times where he would negotiate, like uh, in Vietnam, he, he's, he's very methodical about what he does or what he did. Mm-hmm. He, uh, when he's shooting a scene, he would not talk to anyone except the producer or the DP before the scene. He wouldn't talk to any of the guests because he wanted to, like, when the scene began, everything's, the cameras are all rolling, everything's going. He didn't want to have a conversation with someone in advance where he'd go, oh, shit, that's really interesting, and bring it up again. He wanted it to all be, like, First time. natural and happen as it happened. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we would all be traveling, and then he would, like, show up right when the scene is supposed to start mm-hmm. and then go. And so a couple of times I was like, hey, you know, I have all this time before this scene this evening. Can we get together and shoot something beforehand? And he was like, yeah, I don't want to do that because, you know, we'll do it after. We'll do it fine. And I go, okay, that's cool. But then we're in Vietnam one day, and I was like, hey, look, they're, you know, marketing's really hounding me. I have to send them something tonight. And he's like, okay, you know, we'll shoot it after the, the dinner scene. I was like, okay, cool. And <laughs> he was so drunk. Like the guy that he knew was a guy who'd been in a scene before and they just kept drinking. Mm-hmm. And when the scene was over, on they, they kept coming and taking beers. But when the scene was over, there were at least a dozen beers on Tony's side of the table still. Mm-hmm. And he was super drunk. And he's like, Holloway, let's do this. And I was like, oh, fuck, this is not good. Like, look insane right. and like i you know i shoot a bunch of pictures and like they're not very good and i was like okay dude like let's let's go do something else let's go I'm like all right great we leave and then the next morning i see him and the thing i was like dude that's not gonna work and he's like what and i showed him a couple of the pictures and he's like oh oh <laughs> let's start shooting pictures before let's just schedule so then it was really good because Sometimes, like, I would get up in the morning when we're traveling. He did jujitsu every morning. And depending on what our schedule was, a lot of times I didn't have anything that I had to do until he was going to be around. So I would get up and we'd go to jujitsu together, we'd do whatever. And he'd have a window in there while the rest of the crew shooting B roll or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'd go, Hey, can we go, you know, on the roof of the hotel? Or I found this place. You know, over here, can we go shoot? Can I go shoot you in this cafe or whatever? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, it was really good um, because it was just learning to read him, you know, learning to read the subject. What what can you get away with? There's a totally space. This is what happens when you don't sleep enough kids. Uh, I'm going to look up. His name, because I feel bad for not remembering him right now. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Anyways, there's a photographer that I know who I I like, but I think he's super ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me a little bit about how he works. His photos are about, you know, he shoots a lot of celebrities and stuff. He does exactly the opposite of what I do. He... He like all these pictures just look super uncomfortable, mm-hmm. like super awkward. And so he was telling me like some of the things that he'll do is like he always tries to shoot his photo first. Yep. Because then, you know, the PR or the town be like, what? Well, no, let's target you. We got to shoot other things. He was telling me like uh, there was a box or he was. You know, shooting, whatever, 
and they're shooting in a hotel room. And he's like, yeah, this space is terrible or whatever. And he came in and he just, you know, was sort of acting like he's getting ready. And he like put the boxer in a corner of the room and then pushed a table with a plant on it right up in front of him. And he's like, you know, what, what are we doing here? She starts shooting a picture out about four or five photos. And then the guy like stepped down. He's like, man, I don't want to, what is that? I don't want to do that. He already had his picture uh -huh. because his goal is never to, to flatter people. His goal is to create these awkward situations, yeah. which are amazing. And he's very good at it. I'm constantly trying to go like, Oh, how does, this, you know, how do I visualize this person? Uh -huh. Like, I love the idea of awkward situations, but I want my pictures to be representative of something that's real. Right. Uh, and so a lot of times I feel like I've lost some things uh, because I'm trying to cater to them a little bit. Uh -huh. But if you're persistent in it, there's like some things like I, in uh, Lebanon, I, you know, I told Tony, um, yeah, and I want to shoot you on the roof. Like, it's really cool. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff up there that we can do, like, just go up there. And then uh, he's like, okay, you know, if five minutes before, you know, we go get the car. And then uh -huh. he came up there and we started shooting. And then we went up up there for like 45 minutes or an hour. Mm -hmm. Just hanging out, like talking and like looking at the city, shoot a couple of pictures. And then we go look at some other thing. We just talked about the different stuff that had happened that week. And those kind of moments are like, I mean, pretty precious. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I had a lot of really good ones with them, but I think about the idea that, like, uh, you know, those, like, little, like, private things. Like, he got up there, and he was super excited. Wow, yeah, this is, like, just stay here all day. And we got a car with him. He's like, I mean, are they going to start without me? Like, oh, yeah, they're not going to start without you. We can fucking hang out here all day. Let's do it. Uh, um, anyways, I moved to DC. I, uh, met a guy named Michael Ducille, who was, uh, so I had a theory. It's a smart theory. Time out. It's a smart theory. I had a rent to pay in my house where I lived with all these people. Mm -hmm. And it was not very much rent. I didn't have to make a lot of money. But as I was trying to figure things out, I was like, oh man, it'd be really good if I got a job at a photo lab so I could process my film for free and you know i get to look at pictures all day long whatever and this is 96 97 something like that and so uh, i start doing this and after like two days i instantly realized i've made a terrible mistake uh because the people who at that time took their photos to one hour photo labs their photos are terrible right and so you know, I'm like, oh, man, I'm just getting bummed out about photos by looking at this all day long. So after two weeks, I told the owner, I was like, yeah, dude, I got I to gotta quit. Like, this is not doing me any favors. And he goes, why don't you work in my frame shop? You know, try that out. And I'm like, well, okay, whatever. So then I switched and I started working in his frame shop. And most of the stuff was, like, kind of garbage. But then one day... Uh, a guy, a woman brought in two photos from Kenya. And one of them was of an awesome photo of an elephant dust going everywhere. And the other photo was of the church that I knew. There's a photo at the church too. Mm -hmm. And a woman comes in to pick up the, the finished pieces. And I'm talking to her. I was like, oh yeah, I've been to this church. And then she she's got to make an accent. I'm talking to her. And um, she... You know, she's like, oh, my husband took them, and we were auctioning them off at our church. We're like, fundraiser. And I'm like, oh, cool. Who's your husband? Oh, his name's Michael C. And I was like, oh, I actually know him because he's in my notebook of the people that I'm supposed to call. But I didn't realize that he's a deputy photo editor at um, – deputy photo director at Washington Post. So the next day, he calls me. Me and he's got a question about the framing. Uh -huh. So I'm talking to him, and I go, Oh, yeah, we can see your friends. And we talk about that a little bit. He's like, 
why are you working in this Photoshop? And I started to tell him my theory. I'm like, yeah, but I'm really just trying to be plants and whatever. He's like, okay, bring your portfolio to work. He's like, I'm going to stop by when I leave work tomorrow. I was like, okay, cool, cool. So he comes by and he looks at photos and he's like, yeah, what are you doing working here? You could like be just shooting and, you know, making more money than that. I was like, yeah, well, you know, start trying to figure this out, trying to meet people. And so on, on my office, I started going to the Washington Post and then just hanging out by the light table where all the photo the photo editors and photographers would look at film when it first came out of uh, the wash. Mm -hmm. So I got to, like, be in on all these conversations of, like, some of the best photographers at that time talking about what they're doing and i hung out there for a few weeks and then finally michael uh took me over to this woman sharon farmer or one of the photos there and said okay give david an assignment and then you know she's like okay and she like i don't even remember what first assignment was what i do remember is the sharon said um okay i'm gonna send you to this but leave your 24 millimeter lens at home and I was like, what? That's my favorite lens. That's whatever. And she goes, I know it's your favorite, but you are not, not a good wide angle shooter. It's like, I don't want you wasting my time, like just bringing me back a bunch of terrible pictures that are too wide and whatever. And I was super hurt at that point. I was like a bratty kid, like sewn off, you know, biting my lip. And I went and did the shoot, but like I started looking through a bunch of my favorite photos, like, Eugene Richard or someone like that who shoot a really wide angle and like it's like a, a, an honest master right? and it hurt a ton but I was like oh man Sharon is right I am not that good at that you know, whatever so I started a game then I started getting a lot of time which was good but I started a game where I, I would um, walk into a room there were multiple photographers shooting it where like in DC there are a lot of photographers and a lot of things but I would always try and determine who I thought was the best photographer mm -hmm. and then I would like try and stand by them mm -hmm. I would like pay attention to what lens they're using I would like listen to when they're firing it's just like trying to pre-visualize what they were doing and I did that for months and then I had a weird series of events and so this guy Michael Williamson, who was a photographer at the Post, who I didn't know him very well. I just met him a couple of times. But then I'm standing by him, and then on one day, then the next day, we're at another thing, and it's just a few of us, and I'm standing by him again, and we start, he starts talking to me, and I just start telling him, oh, yeah, so I'm trying to be a better photographer, and this is my theory, and so that's actually why I'm standing by you, is because I think, I think you're probably the best photographer in the room, and whatever, and he was like, wow, that's actually not it's not a bad theory, but kind of sense. It's like, yeah, it works out. Then the very next day, he and I were on a shoot by ourselves. Uh, and it was a thing where police were going to raid this drug house. And we were both, I was shooting, I think, for the Washington Times, and he was the post. And we're both there. And it was amazing because he already knew like what I was doing now. But every time I would take a picture, he like, nope. 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 That's your shot. Nope. That's the one. And I was like, oh, he's a little bit arrogant. Oh, I don't know. I got back and I processed my film. I looked at it and I was like, holy crap. He's totally right. He knew it every single time. And so it, it helped evolve the way I was thinking about actually photographing. Like what, what are moments or what are sort of personal vision? And how do you represent something, you know, because there, there are techniques and tools that can elevate you, you can elevate kind of everyone. If you kind of, you know, play in that structure, you can con consistently do great work. And then when you get to that point where you've mastered that, then you have to like figure out your own way, your own vision. How do you put your tweak on to make it right. uniquely yours? Um, yeah. So I started photographing a lot. 
Uh -huh. I had a guy that I was assisting named Steve Brown, and he was a guy from a generation group before me in DC. He is the now he's got a book on a World War II memorial. He's got a bunch of stuff uh -huh. uh, going on, but he um, is a kind of a crotchety old guy. And I'd started. I had a few things happen. Like one, there used to be an organization called Editorial Photographers, and it was like a group, a sort of not a union, but they would, you know, lobby together to help argue for contract disputes or whatever. And they had a website at this point. It's like a sort of early thing, like a list. They might have, they definitely had like an AOL group. They had some stuff at that time. But I went to uh, like a conference in Richmond, Virginia, and they were having like a talk. And a bunch of these guys, that are big photographers that were in editorial photos. They were talking about how we all need to stand better because these contracts are, are not good. And, you know, with the magazines, Newsweek pays me the same rate that they paid me, you know, 15 years ago, and I get less days, whatever. And I listen to all this stuff, and then like, they're taking questions, and I want to make, make a comment. Uh, I go, listen, I hear what you're saying, but like I live in a house with five other guys and I have assisted most of you, you know, I know I've seen your equipment closet with your quarter of a million dollars worth of equipment. And I've seen that you have, have you know, you built an addition of your house that you own. And I know that you have two cars. It's like all this is making me think is that I need to call every one of these clients and that you guys are complaining about this door was open for me. And so I got kicked out of the drill of photography. Uh, I got kicked off the group. Like I got blacklisted from that stuff. But I started calling all these people. And so then I started doing like regular assignments for Newsweek. And I started doing regular assignments for time. And I started getting a ton of work. And so that, that was like pretty good because I was, you know, I was sort of building a name in DC as an up and coming person who works. And uh, I had a guy, one of the guys who was one of the main guys at editorial photos call me and he's like, okay, hollow look, I want you to come over here. I, I want to have a whole business. And he you know, like sat me down and like, like, I just want to make sure you know that you don't have to undersell the market. Like, I don't think I'm underselling anything. Like, the rates that I'm billing them are the same rates that they pay everyone else. Okay. It's just way more money than I was making assisting you. You know, so it's sweet, a sweeter deal. And I'm trying to be a photographer. I'm not trying to be in this. Not that I haven't learned a lot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he gave me like, you know, Kind of have to talk about how to negotiate a little bit, and I think I've gotten pretty good at it. Not great, but uh, better. And um, then through all that, I, I tried to start an agency with a couple of people, and right at the point we did it for a little while, a couple of years, year and a half, and right when we started making, uh, started breaking even. Then um, one of the one of my partners had a lawsuit against Corbis. It was a big agency, and it, the lawsuit was like kind of a scam. Anyway, there were several people who were suing Corbis and making millions of dollars. And so he had a thing that he was trying to do um, that he you know about some missing images. And so then we had to constantly go through. The archives and which pictures weren't returned, which we still had, whatever. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, it was a big deal, but it was very frustrating. And so we did. Hey, Dave, I'm going to stop. Shut down the agency while he sorted out his lawsuit. I'm going to stop I, for a second. Just yep. my connection is something's gotten so bad. I'm hearing like every third word. <laughs> oh. Hang on. Well, the third word is the only one that matters. All right, hang on. Let's see if we can get it better. 
All right, now now suddenly you're going fine. You're a little blurry. Am I blurry now? Oh, that's what I am. Fine. Yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, you're a little blurry. You're like I got blown up pretty bad. So, so. A little garbly. Um. Anyway, it was a lot of work. I wound up, you know, just through different relationships, meeting people. Uh, I started working for the Discovery Channel, and, and I had a friend, uh, Eric Larson, who had done several fun for him, and they loved him. Mm-hmm. But so I got a name, and I called some people, and they were in Maryland, and I went had a meeting with them. And the work was fine. Like, I think that they all, all understand that the work has to be of a certain level. Uh-huh. But the thing that made a real difference is that I told them that my friend Eric had, had connected me with them. Mm-hmm. And they were like, oh, my, Eric is great. Eric is awesome. We love Eric. We, you know, he's amazing. And so because of my connection to Eric, they started giving me jobs. Ah. And some of them were amazing, like for the Puppy Bowl. Uh, I was a photographer for the first seven seasons of the Puppy Bowl. Which mm-hmm. Sounds super goofy, and it a little bit was. It honestly was one of the funnest days, two days of every year. I was always looking for it, and I wear Puppy Bowl shirts around. Mm-hmm. Those shirts have gotten me more free things than, than literally any. You like walk into like a restaurant or something and have. Puppy Bowl shirt on, and someone would make a comment about it. I go, Oh, you like Puppy Bowl? Yeah, I work Puppy Bowl. What? You work on, I watch Puppy Bowl every year. I got Puppy Bowl straight. Hey, oh, here, let me, you know, buy you a drink. Let me give you some free stuff. Let me do whatever. But always people were very excited about it. So, uh, and I get it because Puppy Bowl is super fun, super weird. Uh, but it was another. It's like actually another thing that I, I I think about a lot. So if you haven't seen Puppy Bowl, uh, Puppy Bowl runs it airs at the same time as the Super Bowl. And what it is is a collection of of uh, of dogs that need to be adopted. All of them are, are eight weeks old. They are untrained, crazy puppies that run like mad. They built a small set to look like a football stadium, mm-hmm. and then they just put the dogs in there, and then they film it, the dogs playing and doing whatever, and then they have a commentator talk over it, and it's like a football game, and it, it runs the length of the time that the Super Bowl is. It uh, it ran on Animal Planet, and it was the second highest rated show in Animal Planet history. And uh, be behind something to do with Shark Week, because Shark Week is always a huge deal, too. I was talking to one of the producers and the directors from time, because I had to do all this stuff with them. I was like, I don't know. I feel like we should give them jerseys or something. We should give them them do all this stuff. Like, there's, like, other stuff that we could do. And then the producer was like, David, when something works Perfectly. When something's better than you ever could have expected it to be, uh-huh. just leave it alone for a while. <laughs> you know, and they've like added like little things it's like they had a kitten halftime show, they had hamsters and blimp, they had like lots of like silly things. Uh, really, it's the essence of like, you know, the fire on the TV when you don't have a fireplace or something. It's just. It's like a YouTube video for like three hours uh, of cute puppy tricks. Puppiness. Super awesome. Hey, okay. So Super my- fun to do and not – yeah, give me a real question. I'm going to give you a real question. I'm rambling. I'm, I'm, going, back, I'm going back to my, my, my kiddos here. So they're all the same, you know, 18. Okay. Actually, they're all from – they range probably from 18 to 22 who probably watch or listen. Oh, my God. I was at a – I know you were. So if you, knowing what you know now and knowing where they are now, what's the piece of advice you'd give them? Oh, man. You have all of the freedom and all of the accessibility in the world available to you. Uh, If you have an idea, it's the most important thing. Like, you should... 
you should try every name. Someone's giving you an assignment. Like, you should try it. There's a lesson you learn. But you should trust in, in your ideas, in your, in your like, genuine interests, because there are the, – the world has changed. Uh, and that, not that there are a lot of them that are doing it. There are a handful of people who make fortunes on social media. Mm-hmm. And there are a bunch of people who make, you know, who like who learn to monetize it in a way that is better than a regular job for them. Yep. And you guys are at a place where you have access to, you know, all of the things you need to sort of pursue that. You social media gives you a voice where you can, you know, you can be your own journalist. You can be. Um, you know, you you can be anything you want. There's like a lot of people. I, I'm critical of him because he makes some big mistakes. But there's a guy named Sean King who lives in town. Who was like a became famous for his, his uh, activism after during after Charlottesville, mm-hmm. and you now he's like he's like blown up specifically because of things that he's put online, and he's some like, real mistakes. He's got, you know, book deals and he's doing commentary on news programs. And he's like come he's become brand. And it's just because he put the time into doing, you know, that thing, be, becoming the authority on that thing that he's interested in. Right. Um you know, you guys should be, you know, making your own content and it's, i'm not saying you need to be a youtuber i'm saying that like the market is such that if you wanted to for instance like be a television host or be involved in travel or do any of those things you can start right now making content in the area that surrounds you mm-hmm. and uh and it it will resonate. You you have all of the tools there. The single most important project that I have ever worked on and, and literally still working on, I started when I was a student at tech. And I didn't show it to anyone for ten years, which was maybe a mistake. But then when I did show it to people, you know, they were like, Oh crap and they viewed me differently and it opened doors. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it all started when I was, you know, sitting in Payne Hall and, uh, or sleeping at the Wesley Foundation. I don't know, I slept a lot of places. Uh, but, you know, if, if you, like, you can learn anything, all of the techniques. You have, have uh, classes where you can use all the things you're learning as products to show that you're growing mm-hmm. like you should all pitch me some ideas and i'll like spitball with you you want a dozen ways you can make that substantial uh, um like literally no ideas are bad ideas uh really like that what i would do if i was in school now is i i would master all of like the all the knowledge I could about YouTube uh, because it's my personal favorite. Mm-hmm. Like there are other ones that are all good, and not that I think that YouTube is the be all end all because I do believe that there's going to be something else coming, and every one of these things plays a role. But YouTube is right now, and I would like I would probably try and make like I found an Instagram. Um, uh, I'll have to find it and send it to Billy. But I just stumbled upon that is uh, these beautiful photos, beautiful videos. They're super short, like ten seconds long, of uh, a guy using camera. Could potentially be GoPro. I don't know if there's a footage of it. It's really nice, but he's using a dome on the front of the camera, and he's shooting a ton of stuff in Alaska that are all really simple in clear water streams. He's doing this like 
split level, like coming from underwater and then coming up to a beautiful scene. And that's all it is. Mm -hmm. But they're stunning. And not all of them are. He's got how many he's got on there. But the whole reason I tuned in this thing is because of a video that I saw of a rock falling. And the camera's falling at the same speed as the rock. And then the rock goes underwater. And then, you know, the air, you know, goes around it. The bubbles all go up. But it's super beautiful. And it's like a, a five second clip because he's doing it in slow motion. Like it really happened. Mm -hmm. Super fast. Well, after seeing that stuff, I started looking the guy up, and he's shooting all this stuff in Alaska. But there are a couple of other people who have totally co opted his style, and they were doing all of this like travel social media in Iceland, mm -hmm. like ad campaigns. They're doing ex exactly what he's doing, you know, thing on a boom, thing out of glaciers your water to boom, waterfall in the background and they're like five seconds long but it's kind of the future of in my opinion the future of like what most of these companies are going to want to put out there something quick and beautiful <laughs> i have a friend who uh tamron is a gear company uh, yep and my friend had come to me he said look, look i got a deal with tamron and they were me to shoot social videos. If I want you to help me shoot these videos, uh, he's like, I'm getting fifteen hundred dollars a video, and so uh, he had a meeting with him, and he's like, okay, what well, you know, what do you want, like three videos for social, ten minute videos, then have they're like, no, we want fifteen second videos. It's like, what? How can we tell the big thirty second, like one to be on Instagram Live? We want Mm -hmm. Just these little things. He's making fifteen hundred bucks a video. Like that's like. So he's making a thousand dollars a second. I don't know what does that add up. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's crazy. Come on. Or a hundred dollars, <laughs> not a thousand dollars. He's making that's a hundred dollars like, a second. Okay. Hundred dollars. Yeah. Hundred dollars. Yeah. That's pretty good money. Yeah. <laughs> now I don't know what's going to happen when he sends them like three hours. Hours for the video, but uh, that, was, that was a joke, folks. Um, no, so there are a lot of possibilities out there. I, I really would um, constantly look forward to see because, like, the, the key with social media is you know, if you can get in something early enough, mm -hmm. then you can, it's easier to be recognized, right? You know, whatever. Now, there's like a handful of people with like. 20 million followers on uh, on YouTube, and you can compete with them. You don't have to have that many followers, but right. um, you know it's harder. You know, and you also have to. I think the, another thing that's important is learning to repurpose content for every platform. Mm -hmm. Like, not that you have to put it on every platform, but just understanding, like, oh, if I'm shooting something for a client, and I wanted to shoot you know, whatever, this interview with, uh, with Billy, mm -hmm. how do I shoot it so that I can provide them with more options than they're expecting? How can I give them like a vertical video option? How can I give them, you know, like right. what's going to be the thumbnail for the video thing? What, what are all the ways it can be used? And if you guys learn that stuff, um, you know, you, you have, I know you think that your time is, I think, I think that you're so busy, you literally will never have more, more time than you have winter college. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's true, though. It's, you have, like, you have so much freedom, and, you know, it's kind of up to you to go, all right, I'm going to maximize this and, you know, master something. And, like me, me following around the photographers that I think were the best. Imitation, especially in the beginning, is 100% acceptable. Uh, I know there's the book, what's the name of uh, Austin Kleon's book, uh, Steal Like an Artist, mm -hmm. that the basic idea is that like there aren't 
there are very few real original ideas. Oh, that's not funny. Uh, there are very few real original ideas, and so most of the most of the headway that we make is from imitating other people, mm -hmm. and then through that you like you know figure things out. The other night when I was trying to figure out how to how to make all those videos on one uh, one premiere page, like I was struggling because I was just following the directions, but it wasn't wasn't clicking with me like exactly what I was doing. And, you know, I'm just mimicking what I'm seeing on the YouTube thing. But then when I went to sleep and woke up the next day and it was crystal clear in my mind, mm -hmm. I then came up with exactly, because I've been trying to think of like what I wanted to do to make a sizzle reel for a while. Because mm -hmm. I've got a ton of video and I'm not a, I'm not a great editor, you know. I'm trying to figure out how to put it together together in a way that it's like interesting and I can go to people and not go oh yeah I'm not that great at editing uh, mm -hmm. but through that thing when I woke up the next morning I was putting them together I then had a vision for like the direction I wanted my uh, sizzle reel to go mm -hmm. so you just start mimicking things and then you know things will Things will pop up. You'll come up with ideas that will be either unique or different or whatever, just through the process of doing the work. Right. Got to do the work, kids. But also, call me. Send me an email. Text me. Bounce ideas off me. I'll tell you if I think they're terrible. I probably hey, tell people how to contact you. Will tell them terrible. How can they find you? Uh, you can you can email me at hello at datescotthallway.com. That's H E L L O at David Scott Holloway .com. Yep. You can uh, send me um, an Instagram message. Also, Instagram is at David Scott Holloway. Uh, and then uh, if you email me, then I'll send you my number if you want to text me something off in the middle of the night. Cool beans. So I rambled a lot here, kids, but uh, you've got a lot of potential and a lot of. Uh, Freedom, a lot of options. I go crazy. I think we're going to do this again at some point. I think I want, I want to go ahead and cut this that. guy's brain. Do what? Say that again. I was like, pick this guy's brain. I was telling him, pick your brain. Pick brain. Yeah, lots of brain picking going on. Yeah, I, um, I just decided, yeah, we've got enough that I'm just going to bring you back on as like a regular. You're just going to be the regular. Yeah, let's do it. Let's just we're regular. So I got to set my, I think the I other wanna, thing is. I want to sneak in. Do I want to sneak in when Alice is talking. We can do it. I can just bring you both on at the same time. That's you know, technology works that way. I can. Don't, no, don't don't tell her that I'm here. Don't I'll tell her that I'm going to be. I'm not. Here. I'll just I'll, oh, just, yeah. I'll just I'll just you both, and I'll just like, boop, and then suddenly Dave's on the screen too. Yeah. I still Perfect. want to do that idea that I have where I just go on a road trip and I go visit old students, <laughs> home, and then I just put you in the back seat, and you're yeah. just that, and you don't actually have to say anything. You just just in the back. I, I want to do color commentary. Just do it. <laughs> there's so many wait i don't even know what it's there's a there's a instagram uh that i love so much and it is a guy who is doing super funny commentary over street fights over what he's so funny it's over street fights he's got videos oh. that he finds all night looking at street fights yeah and then he just does color commentary over so <laughs> funny and i really feel like like it's such a it's such a goofy idea you know? but right. i've i've definitely watched every single thing that i've ever found of and i feel like that's a sort of idea literally anyone can take he's not he's not making the video content he's sourcing it off you know mm -hmm. there's a million you can just find any ridiculous thing and like find a way to reprint it uh, and elevate it, and yep. it's amazing. So, all right, well, I'm we still it. haven't talked about last night. Oh, we haven't. Or let's go ahead and try it. Like, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, what are we like? Uh, uh, we're like at two and a half hour. Oh, we're at two hours. We're good. We're fine. Oh my god. Uh. <laughs> So yeah, the, only, the only thing that's concerning me on this is I'm like, 
I'm like, how's the audio going to sound? Because there's a cutting out a lot. But you know what? It, it kind of it goes in phases. Like oh. it goes, it gets bad and then it gets good again. So right now oh, we're in a good spot. So let's do a quick. Okay. It's because it's timely. Let's do a quick wrap up of your you know, of the uh, debate last night and the first Trump Biden debate. What was your What was your takeaway? So the, uh, it's actually been in a, at a uh, presidential uh, debate. <laughs> Yeah, it it hurts so much. I I've been to uh, I've been to several of them, and I've been to dozens of candidate debates. Like, you know, when there's still well Democrat trying to become right. president. And the thing is, generally, those people like they might get aggressive like on stage a bit, but they actually like each other. They respect each other. Right. They, uh, you know, they. They might say snarky thing because, you know, it gives them some points. But last night was so painful. Uh, honestly, I feel like the only solution, first of all, I'm embarrassed as an American. Like, okay, the whole world should watch. Like, yeah, this, this is my quick take on the presidency. I think that I think that Joe Biden uh, can be a very good president. Uh, he might not be a marvelous theater, but he is a thoughtful person who knows what he's doing. I personally believe that uh, there should be like a general cap on how old a person can be to be president. Because, don't mean to sound ageist here, but people slow down and people do whatever. I believe that if a person were between 50 and 65. That's like my optimal presidential age. Someone who's lived enough to be wise yep. and still can be super sharp about everything. I mean, they have, it's not really fair because well, they have a bottom Trump. age because you can't, you know, you can't run for president until you're right. 35. So there could be a top age. Right. Yeah. I mean, there should be even. I mean, there's some some differences. Like, uh, you know, maybe women physically age better, take care of themselves. But like, Elizabeth Warren, you know, is the same age as those two yahoos, and she doesn't come across as like kook. Uh, no, um, no, she. Yeah, she's still the thing is, healthy. The thing is. Uh, with last night, I feel like it was not produced well in like in the other ones you know they they'll turn people's mics off yeah why did they not just turn his mic off when it wasn't his turn i i don't like i don't know yeah because that obviously like, okay it's your turn like i'm sure they'll do that at the next one. if they, right they'll if another one happens like if, if both those guys don't go screw it i'm not doing that a hundred percent like i think Yep. I'm a big favor of you know them, better, but, you know shot callers would be good too you know you get one warning right right <laughs> but it's it's like em, it's embarrassing to think about like you know first of all there were a ton of lies said last night that are you know easily provable but it doesn't matter because I I honestly don't think. I don't think that there is a person in the country who's uh, who changed their decision last night. Right. I don't think anyone was like, oh, "Well, you got me." I think everyone was just shaking head and sad for America. Yeah, I I just sort of equated it as, um, as you know the the Thanksgiving dinner where you've got a couple of old uncles that got drunk and just got in a fight over dinner, and right. you know one of them's pointing a turkey right. at the other and. Um, yeah, because I have a friend in Australia who started. Yeah, but there's like one. And he, you he know, started what? I said I've got a buddy in Australia, and he's he was messaging me. He's like, it's reality TV for them. Um, we're just yeah. watching it, and like you people are insane. And you know, this is coming from. Well, that's what crazy. that's what Trump wants it to be. Yeah, I think he totally wants it to be reality. The chaos thing. I think of things in more narrative form now. Um, his strategy is chaos. It's always been chaos. And I think yeah. that works. Like when people sort of get 
you know, you talk about a status quo and sometimes you need to like, you know, mix things up to, you know, evolve into the next thing. Uh, the difference is at some point you've got to, like the chaos can't hang around forever. Like if storytelling, you can't have conflict forever or suspense forever. There's a point you've got to have some sort of resolution where you bring things back. And I think he's just kind of continuing the chaos. And that's the part that's starting to wear thin on a lot, a lot more people than it used to. At least for me. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. It just, felt, it was just a bunch of, well, we got a month <laughs> left. Let's see how it goes. So excited. So <laughs> I I feel like um you know I I've I've distanced myself from politics of this cycle and I feel like um you know I mean it's hard everyone sort of distance but I also feel like I don't know that I have the emotional energy to you know to deal with like if if I were like they're doing campaign stuff right now, it's just like come on, please. Like you can be opinionated and you can be mean and be whatever, but like, can you also just be honest? Right, just for a minute. Like I don't have to agree with you on anything. Like just give me something straight here, so I don't have to. Yeah, it's that sort of you're waiting for that moment. you're waiting for that moment, that moment of sincerity that just doesn't ever seem to show up. So I don't know. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah. Sorry, sorry to all the Trump fans who are watching, but you guys are wrong. <laughs> it is terrible. Oh, there you go. There's this is fake, terrible fake news. Hey, that's that's let me ask you that real quick quick question. As someone who's you know, you hung out at CNN for a while. Like, whenever you like, yeah. what would what is your diagnosis of the state of modern media? It's like mainstream media, anyway. Um. Well, it it's it's a, it's a mess. So, did you watch that documentary? What's the documentary called? You watched it, right? Which which one? I think you're the first person I saw that posted about it. The documentary on Facebook. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, what's it called? The uh, we're talking about the. I haven't uh, watched it yet. The, the social media one on a the, the um. Yes, social dilemma. The social dilemma. The social yep. dilemma. Yep. Kids, all sit down and watch it. Yep. Uh, I think that that is, uh, like, ultimately steering uh, all media, mainstream media too, because most people, you know, like I had a discussion with my dad the last time I was home. He was like arguing about how well they're you know, all full of bullshit. They're all whatever. No, they're not. There's truth out there, but it's being clouded because you get all of your news through Facebook headlines. Right. He doesn't watch the news. He doesn't he doesn't have he doesn't even have a, a like a news brand that he trusts. Right. Everything that he gets, all incoming, it's just like he's not even reading stories. You know? Mm-hmm. And my mom had this conversation with her where she posted something on Facebook that sounds super crazy and sensational. And I have to like, go snoops it and whatever. And I have to talk to my mom about, look, this is easy to fill up. Like, a little Honestly, it is. Uh huh. Oh, I, I was funny because I didn't hear any of the last if ones. If you're shocked by somebody, you can almost. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can, I was really excited because your your face looks so right. passionate, and I'm just like, oh, I can't hear a thing he's saying right now. Yeah. I had I had a very uh, no. I was just saying that. I had I had a very similar conversation with one of my boat neighbors last week. I live, you know, and I've got a lot of Trump friends as fans. Oh, yeah. or, 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 you know, I've got a bunch of Trump fans as friends. You know, I can I can walk that line and yeah. hang with that crowd. And but yeah, we were having the same conversation. You know, and he's seventy something year old guy, and he's you know there's and he said he said the same thing. There's you know there's no good journalism out there anymore. And I was like, yeah, actually there is. 
I was like, but there's, I said, there's just a lot of other bad stuff sure. pretending to be journalism. And then I said, they have really good websites and it looks authentic, but it's not. Right. So. Right. And the problem that, that also, those stories get sucked into, those stories become mainstream news because then you constantly question like, I don't know, I can't even think of any stupid story right now, but you know, it winds up being part of the thing that they have to discuss. Yeah, somebody or like Trump just standing on stage, interrupting with lie after lie after lie. Come on, folks. Like, honestly, who <laughs> if you ask yourself, that's like the thing that a lot of people like always say, like, oh, I'd, you know, I'd vote for this person because I can imagine myself sitting down and having a beer with them. I have been in great proximity Donald Trump many times, uh-huh. and every time it's been obvious that he is the fucking worst person in the room. Yeah. Like, ask yourself who you want at your Thanksgiving dinner. Like, fucking Tony Blowhard or, you know, like an honest, genuine person who has maybe made some mistakes much like you have, but who is a real human Mm -hmm. uh, with real concerns for, you know, other people with real empathy. Yep. Uh, I feel why don't the left, why don't the left have crazy assassins? I don't know. I don't know. The other thing that I think I've been, I was writing a thing about this probably like the last thing. But, uh, you know, a couple of people have talked to me about, like, my work on the far right. And, uh-huh. like, oh, you, you know, you should be working right now. Do you feel like you're, like, missing a window? And 100% I don't because 100% I believe that it will get worse. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh- you know, the if, if Biden wins and, you know, the government, you know, find some sort of stability, some sort of normalcy. It uh, doesn't matter because when these organizations are broken down, like organizations are less of a threat in their organization. Right. When they break down and they're individual people who feel desperate and who feel trapped, like, you know, all these people are empowered right now because they have, you know, they don't, they say he's not there guy they say you know but he's the closest thing they have right uh you know once he's gone it's, it's just reinforced to them that there are mainstream people who can buy into their ideas it's enough to so like yeah trump is proof that they're mainstream go ahead no go ahead it's enough to what i would just say it's well, just that idea that There's a delay. I, I was just, <laughs> it's, it's enough that it like the, the the kind of fringe ideas have gotten enough of a platform lately that they've they've started to merge back into some of the mainstream thought. It gets into you get enough of this, and then suddenly they're like, well, maybe they have, maybe you know, maybe these guys have a point, and then it gets talked on, you know, whatever. Well, and then the algorithms are reinforced in the. In the in the short doc that I did for NBC, uh, Billy Roper, our famous uh, uh, racist, uh, explains what his role at like right now is, mm-hmm. and he says that his job is to say the most inflammatory, furthest right things, so he can he can push the conversation so far to the right. He's like, he doesn't expect many people to buy into what he's saying. Mm-hmm. But he pushes it so far to the right that then when other people will come in and fill in that space, you know, on the right, mm-hmm. not quite as far as he is, but further from the left, then they seem more acceptable. Right. He's, he's just, he's moved the standard over. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that's his whole strategy, and it seems to work. Hmm. 
Yep. I don't know. Kids, go get a job. I have a Facebook and fix Facebook. Yeah, just go or just go make the new Facebook. Yeah. You know? That's uh that's one of the things I used to tell them. I was like, look, you know, some of the biggest inventions that, you know, dictate your life now are created by people that are your age. Um, so get busy. Mm -hmm. so make some innovation happen. Yeah. Fix America. And it's not as it's not as difficult as you really think it it is. On some level, like, you know, Casey Neistat, um he had this app Bean. Mm -hmm. which I don't know if any of you downloaded it. It is not very good. Uh, it was never very good. Uh -huh. but Casey is a huge, uh, you know, huge person on YouTube, and he was trying to develop this thing. He's full of great ideas, uh, but he, he's not a programmer. He's not like a, you know, a couple programmers help develop in what is you make money doing this other thing but invest it in this project and then he sold it to sin for 20 million dollars mm -hmm. it didn't talk or case like the door like oh cnn paid him 20 million dollars said no no they didn't hire him he was gonna try and do some online stuff with him what they did was they purchased his app mm -hmm. and you know, some that you know, a dude had an idea about. He wound up can't until he found someone who helped him make it, and then you know they made it, made it, and did flop. You know, CNN shelved it. Mm -hmm. They spent all that money. Casey's not even anymore. Like being is not a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. So you know, there there are there are ways. Just you know, reach out to people who are doing things who have skills that you have. All right, and on that, I think we'll wrap it up because the, the connection yeah. the connection is getting bad again. So I'm just like I'm, I'm probably gonna have to edit some of this out. So I'm just whatever it happens to be. We're gonna bring you back on. It's the point. <laughs> we're gonna pick up like all right. I'm gonna like, what, 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 let's do it. Yeah. It, so I think I'm gonna get a set up another one in my. We can just start up. Hey, maybe we can just. We should start like a ten minute podcast and give ourselves a subject to talk about every week for ten minutes. That'll work. I think I'm gonna set. I'm gonna set up another um, okay. quote unquote studio in my office at Tech because I have better internet there. I don't have the fabulous cabin background, but. Yeah. But I have now. I've just got you know. I've got an office attack, and I'll just put a soundboard in, and I've got everything. Yeah. It plugged right. in, and put a microphone in. I just don't have the cool ambience of the cab. I would just recreate that. I, would... I could, yeah. I just create a plywood no, I would wall, a wall, like fake wall. It's fake wall behind me. Yeah. Which uh, is, <laughs> let's do that. I'll, maybe I'll just go full blown pirate at the cabin, and I'll just it's like you're on a ship. So, all right, Dave. It's been fun. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so I will catch up with you later, and then we have other things to discuss at some point about making stuff, more stuff. That's true. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks That's right, right. All right, Dave, have a lovely day. All right. Bye.